Brandt Farm is in Fairfield County, Ohio. Fairfield County is on the edge of the glacial till in the center of Ohio. Uh, so we have some highly variable soils, uh, mostly uh, clay-based soils. Uh, so on our farm, the home farm itself, there's 11 different soil types uh, from that standpoint. Uh, so just a little background on that. Um, and we've been involved in the no-till and soil health and conservation practices for several years. Uh, my dad actually got started in no-till back in the early 70s. Uh, he took on a tenant farm uh, after uh, he had to sell the family farm after his father's death and uh, didn't have enough time with managing livestock and a small family to do all the tillage and so started doing no-till practices early in the year. So as he uh, he's worked for the Soil and Water Conservation District, so he's done a lot of talking. And people ask about no-till and how much horsepower does it take for no-till, you know, because you've got to pull through all that residue, right? So we have some Amish in the community, and this was early in the career. Dad got this picture. So here's a two-row planter. It takes four horses to pull it. So, you know, two horses per row, right? So, you know, it's not too bad from that standpoint. Uh, <laughs> So this is our, our family farm here. Um, let's see if I can find the button for that. And you can see our, our neighbor is a fairly conventional guy. So you'll know you'll hit our farm because there's green. There's really not much green anywhere else around this during the fall. This, I think, was last fall. So we have a triticale production field on this side. And this is a cover crop field on this. So it was a cereal rye production last year. Uh, going to corn this year. So we have a multi-species cover crop put in here. All right. Uh, we also, this is a new facility where we clean seed for cover crops and then our main warehouse, which doubles as our machinery shed as well. So between Ann, who manages the cover crop seed business, and my dad, who manages the farm, there's this argument about what we're using the space for. When <laughs> thanks. <laughs> So we started out, and still even back in 2009, uh, the cover crops needed to be dead when we were planting, right? So there's this uh, change in mindset. Uh, we needed it to be crispy brown because, you know, soil is brown and you plant into brown soil, so if they have cover crops, they should be brown. Well, not necessarily, right? So it's a change in mindset. Green is good. This happens to be uh, Harry Vetch, uh, my dad. That's my father, David, standing there. Loves Harry Vetch, has used it quite a bit. Uh, in his, uh, when we started adopting cover crops in the early 70s, he would plant hairy vetch in the uh, waterways where you get a lot of water washes to stabilize the soil. We went to no-till specifically to reduce erosion because we have about 5 to 10% slopes on some fields. And so he was, you know, cost conscious, so it really only put cover crops where there was the most chance of erosion, right, because you want to conserve your time and, and the cost of doing that. Uh, and but he found that there was some significant benefits. There's a difference in crops in those areas where he planted the cover crops, right? So the, the plants looked healthier. Uh, the yield was sometimes better. So we started to expand that planting. And eventually, he got tired of just trying to find the areas where there might be erosion. And he just planted the whole thing, right? So don't worry about it. <laughs> so today, this is what we like to plant into, uh, complex mixes for the most part. Uh, in this mix here, this would have been seeded. This particular example uh, was a CRP field that we got uh, last year. Uh, we were able to get approval to burn down the grass in the fall and plant our, our favorite multi-species combination of cow peas, sun hemp, pearl millet. Uh, those are the warm season components with cool season components of uh, barley, cereal rye, hairy vetch, crimson clover, and winter peas. So and that's what we had growing last spring from that standpoint. So that's about six foot tall at the top of the rye there. And great uh, habitat to plant corn into, we found out. This is usually we don't have this good of uh, cover crop growth in the spring. We happen to have a very good warm fall the previous fall and got a little good growth and good spring growth. So here uh, our cover crop management is to use a roller crimper. This is the I and J crop roller based on the Rodale design. Uh, my mother used in uh, 3020. It's got about 20,000 hours on it. Pulling the roller crimper there. 
and that works really well. So we still use some chemical termination along with this because we do have some persistent weeds and having it been in CRP for 20 years, we just wanted to make sure that things were taken care of and vetch can be problematic uh, to terminate with the roller crimper, so we want to make sure that was taken care of. Uh, so just a good example of what uh, it looks like running a roller crimper. Uh, we really love this tool for laying uh, the cover crop down. It makes it a lot easier uh, to plant into and uh, the plants aren't stressed trying to grow through the tall cover crop. So we talked a lot about uh, the fertility management and things from that standpoint, looking at uh, nutrient availability from these cover crops. Uh, I believe we estimated a good 50 or 60 pounds of nitrogen for the corn cover crop out of that cover crop. Uh, we estimated, or I think uh, Ohio State University measured, we had somewhere around 10,000 to 12,000 pounds of biomass out of that cover crop. Uh, the mulch was about four inches thick from that standpoint, so you can see a good uh, hairy vetch, and that one is pretty thick with that. So this is what it looks like rolled down, nice and flat. This is our, our white planter. It's uh, eight row with inner plants, so 815. Uh, we use uh, visual guidance, so again, we had to roll the cover crop down because it was so thick it was breaking the shear pins on the row markers. So that was why we rolled first. Normally we roll afterwards uh, because we're worried about directionality where the cover crop can build up underneath the planter and cause some planting issues. In this case, because of the hairy vetch and the peas, it was so intertwined, uh, it didn't really matter. Directionality was not an issue. The planter had no trouble penetrating the cover crop and getting a good, good seed placement. So we like planting into cover crops because uh, it's typically very wet for us in the spring when we're planting and mud can be an issue. So you can see there, there is a little bit of moisture on that, but we're not accumulating a lot of mud. Uh, we do run, we keep our planter very simple. Uh, we run a wavy coulter. Uh, this year we're going to a, a smaller bubble coulter uh, to try to minimize the amount of soil disturbance from that standpoint. Um, but really no fancy aftermarkets. We like rubber closing wheels. They work very well. Our soils are, have great tilth. They collapse very well from that standpoint. Uh, again, uh, we have fairly high organic matter because of the cover crop practices. Uh, generally across our farm, just between two to 8%, uh, where most farms in our area are from half to 2%, depending on management practice. So visual is always good. Here we are in that field running the corn planter. Uh, we're not speed kings. From that standpoint, we're not worried about getting everything done as fast as possible just to do a good job. So you can see directionality. It was rolled the opposite direction we're going and we're not having any trouble picking up or collecting that. Uh, we avoid a lot of uh, spike closing wheels and things because that makes a round bale of hay pretty fast in the type of residue that we work with. So we don't see a lot of interference. We do make sure that we're getting good seed placement uh, and that the residue does not interfere with uh, the depth of planting from that standpoint. With this type of residue, uh, we were looking at that and thinking about uh, why is it working and how do we have a good plant health. And we believe that with the rain, because we have about 30 to 40 inches of rain a year, and we get rain pretty much throughout the year. It doesn't really dry out too much for us, usually. <laughs> We expect that this cover crop is acting kind of like the ability to make an in-field uh, compost tea with every rain event. So we have a good combination of high carbon species and low carbon species, uh, and that way we have a very controlled nutrient release from that standpoint, and uh, the rainfall events kind of help us with that. Uh, in this case, this was uh, untreated, non-traded corn. So just keep in mind, uh, non-traded untreated corn. Uh, did pretty well for us this year. That's the seed slot that it looks through. You can see what good openers in the culture, we get good penetration uh, into there. Here we have the, the seedlings emerging. Uh, since this was some heavy cover crop, we were kind of anxious last year to make sure everything came up. Uh, we had just transitioned to non-GMO corn, so we wanted to make sure everything was good and healthy from that standpoint. So we were very pleased to see that kind of emergence from that. A good, healthy stand of corn, very regular, fairly uniform. The big thing for us was that summer, and hopefully you can see our neighbors, which are mainly conventional guys in corn, they run a vertical tillage tool in front of the corn planter to incorporate usually 
some uh, chemical herbicide on our high residue cover crops. Uh, 78 degrees soil temperature in the same day in the neighboring field, 91 degrees. So generally uh, over 90 degrees, we start to see a lot of soil biology just not happening because of the temperature, right? And a lot of plant stress because of that soil temperature. So we're really benefiting from the cooler soil temperatures and retaining soil moisture, right? Because you have less evaporative effect at the lower temperature. So we've looked at other ways to incorporate. So uh, kind of my talk is going our rotation, corn, beans to cereal grain. So this was a high clearance air seeder. We converted a walker high clearance sprayer to a boom applicator for cover crop seeds. Uh, and we tried several ways to get cover crops established in corn uh, using an airplane. Uh, it was very spotty, maybe 10 to 30% uh, success rate on that. Uh, this was uh, much better from that standpoint. Um, but because of the timing with our business, we never got to use this machine very much. Uh, it worked well, uh, but for us, with our long season, not necessary. In some areas where you have a very short season and difficulty to get cover crops established after harvest, uh, this tool, typically this might be what we're doing if it's late. Uh, that's what happened this fall. Here we are in November, and we haven't planted cover crops yet, and we need to put on some lime or some gypsum or something. So we're spreading some uh, cereal rye mixed with uh, whatever soil amendment we need to do at that time, or just rye by itself. Uh, we can spread a 50-foot pattern pretty consistently and, and get it done pretty quickly that way. Uh, being cold and wet this year, this didn't really work very well either. <laughs> so this spring, our, our rye in front of soybeans is very small and fairly spotty, just because a, a lot of it got drowned out. Uh, cereal rye can take a bit of ponding, but not four weeks of it cold temperature, so it's, uh, it's, you know, you're at the limit of what the plant can actually do. So after uh, application, uh, we'll use the cover crop roller again to try to uh, lay down some of that uh, corn fodder, try to get that incorporated near to the soil so we get some uh, turnover there. Always like to see how things go there. And this is my son, uh, who's starting to work with my dad on the farm here and kind of take over the business. We're working on some transition planning. And he likes to go a little faster, so you know, <laughs> all right. So those are some fun things. So we get more utility out of that tool, not only in the spring, but in the fall, right? And it helps shake those seeds down to the soil surface uh, once we've applied it. Oh, so here's a young David Brandt back in uh, 1978, back when we planted green with green equipment, you know, so. <laughs> But uh, very useful at that time. So here we got uh, six foot tall cereal rye back in 1978 planting uh, soybeans in 30 inch rows. Today we use uh, mainly a grain drill. Uh, we plant solid beans just because we like that because dad's using the corn planter to plant corn. Mom in the past was planting soybeans. So it kind of worked out that way. They could get the crop in the ground pretty quickly. So still using the tall rye, just different equipment. After, in this case with soybeans, we'll terminate the, the cover crop after planting. It's much easier with the grain drill to plant into the standing rye. Uh, it doesn't ball up under the system and it doesn't interfere with planting. Uh, our uh, grain drill of choice is a Krauss drill, which is a double disc opener. It does move a little bit more soil than a single disc like a deer or a case uh, might do, but uh, it works very well for us in our clay soils get a little bit of soil movement to help with that warming and uh, get the crop established well. So we'll roll crimp after planting soybeans. With what we're seeing with a lot of information from universities, we can even wait on roll crimping until the soybeans have emerged so that we can plant maybe a little bit earlier from that standpoint and help take that early planting yield advantage uh, without any penalty and allow the cover crop to grow to maturity to improve that and improve that weed suppression Right, which we get from the, the tall cover crop. Here we have the soybeans emerging. Usually no problem. Soybeans are, are very tolerant of a lot of biomass to grow through. Uh, the very hardy plants, very strong from that standpoint. We love to have a residue underneath there, again, right, to keep the soil temperature cooler and to limit small seedling emergence. The challenge we have, we have some large seeded weeds like giant ragweed, and late summer grasses, uh, fall panicum and foxtail, 
uh, which can be problematic, and cereal rye really won't stop. So that's, it's not a miracle, miracle plant in any means. Uh, proper management is very important, uh, as we heard this morning. So again, uh, if you do it right, it looks beautiful like that. So you can do it. Uh, in this case, uh, our practice is to put down uh, pre-emergent herbicide to control broadleaf weeds, uh, mainly things like water hemp, uh, velvet leaf, stuff like that that can be problematic in soybeans. Uh, hopefully with our management that we've got in place, uh, we're pretty weed free where we can go to just using mechanical the roller crimper and go that route. So we're, our goal is to get to that and to have uh, minimize any chemical inputs that we can do. So in soybeans, uh, we tried a lot of things with uh, soybeans as well, aerial application. In this case, it was back in two thir two 2013, we had a field day and showed uh, planting annual ryegrass with radish and crimson clover. Now, this field actually established very well. It was a beautiful stand. Uh, we waited till everything, the crimson clover was in bloom and unfortunately the annual ryegrass was in bloom also. So it took like three applications of herbicide before Dad was satisfied that it was brown. <laughs> so, so he doesn't, we don't promote annual ryegrass very much because of some of those concerns, because timing for termination is very important with that. Uh, it's not difficult if you do it right. If you do it wrong, like we did in this case, you know, you can, you can end up with some trouble. Uh, like I said, uh, Dad got excited about this white planter when it came out because he had the ability to use different seed plates in the 15-inch rows, and we could plant peas and radish uh, in that. So we, instead of doing monoculture, this was our first venture into multi-species cover crops, and uh, by managing that with singulating uh, the seed, uh, you keep your seed rates low and cost low also, which was very important at that time, especially because he had just bought the planter, so you know he had this huge planter plant payment that he's thinking, I can't spend a lot of money on seed, <laughs> or at least mom wouldn't do it, you know, let him do it. And he likes it too, because it looks really nice, precision planted peas and radish, uh, it's visually very, uh, very good, it looks great, uh, it's great for sequestering uh, weeds, because both the peas and the radish grow very quickly uh, in our environment in central Ohio. Uh, and uh, it's really easy management in the spring as well, because both planted after wheat, uh, would mature to the point where they will winter kill fairly easily in our winters, right? Because it's easy for us to get a good week under 20 degrees Fahrenheit and knock everything out, unlike in Georgia where this would be a nightmare in the spring probably, so with bugs and everything else. So, so yeah, here's in the spring. Uh, we have these very large, what we're going to call megapores from the, the radish, and you can see the decayed carcass here, which happens to be uh, where Slugs love to feed and propagate, so you can almost clean up your field if you want to take the time and pick all those things up. But they're a great source of uh, very high phosphorus readings here. What we like to recommend is that you try to plant your corn over the radish row uh, because you have great phosphate availability there for the seedling emergence, and you get really healthy, good emergence from the corn if you can do that. So a lot of guys are doing that bio strip till concept based on uh, that work that we've seen there where they, they plant over the radish row uh, because you have a really excellent weed suppression as well from the residual from that, the radish. The glucosinates from that plant are very excellent for that. So part of our rotation, you know, is to go to the cereal grain and after cereal grains, uh, we do a very heavy cover crop mix to run into corn. We like to have sunflowers in the mix, so we've gone from the, the single species, whether it be only peas or a type of clover or the vetch. Uh, and we see that the, just the single species legume, we were having some issues with soil hardness, which we couldn't quite understand because we're getting very good soil health scores. You know, they keep increasing. We have good soil respiration, but the soils were hard. And after talking to a lot of people, we're using a very high legume concentration cover crop mixes or the single species. And the, the bacterial response to that, because the amount of nitrogen produced in the legumes, would consume and cause this degradation in soil aggregate stability, which would make the soils very hard. So uh, we've come to the conclusion that we need to have some high carbon content in these mixes. We need to include a cereal grain or other broadleaf species to add that uh, amount of carbon in there and to balance that structure to keep the soils looser 
uh, and to improve that cycling of the nutrients that we have in there. Uh, like I said, sunflowers are a hyper accumulator of particular uh, metal, uh, nutrients that are important in the sexual crop that we get as that plant decays next year. Uh, it winter kills, and regardless of the fact that it gets five or six feet tall, it usually falls over in the winter. Uh, if you get any seed production in the heads, the birds pretty much clear that out over the winter. So there's really uh, no problem, especially with some of the, the chemical program that we have that's easily taken out with a lot of the broadleaf herbicides, if there was ever any carryover, which I don't think we've ever seen. Now, on the other side, we have uh, the high legume mixes with a lot of peas, uh, very popular. Uh, the peas nodulate in different areas in the soil, so you have a, a high profile nodulation, mid and low, to hit the points of corn growth. Dad likes to talk a lot about that, how it stratifies that nitrogen in there and is real profitable on that. So we like that. And we're always trying to hit somewhere in that, uh, that biomass. We want to see three to four ton biomass on there to have good soil armor, soil good residue uh, to carry through the next season. So back in 1971, when Dad picked up our old farm, bought it from his grandfather, uh, this is Cardington clay, uh, half percent organic matter that was measured at that point in time. In 2014, uh, measurements by uh, the Ohio State University classified our oil organic matter at around between five to eight percent, depending on where you measured it in the field. So, you know, we're not making soil, but we're improving the soil here. So the, the improvement in water capacity, holding capacity in a drought year, uh, nutrient cycling uh, with what we have going on there has, has greatly improved that. So uh, and this actually comes from uh, my uncle's field, great uncle's field. It's been in 30 years of continuous soybeans. So a little difference there. So again, final shot of the Holden farm here, uh, looking at uh, our, our neighbors, we're in a highly agricultural industry, uh, so everybody loves some fall tillage occasionally in there. And <laughs> so that's, that's where we're at there. Uh, again, the, the concept that we've talked about of using high residue cover crops to manage weed populations, we've been using since 1971, uh, looking at uh, nutrient availability and uh, so the, the type of cover crop mix that we've incorporated, we've learned over several years since uh, about 2010, looking at multi-species. For our region, uh, the combination of clovers, peas, and vetch provide that nutrient cycling with the cereal grains. And so after our cereal grain harvest, we like to have that combination of warm season legume and grass with cool season legume and grass. So we have that both fall and winter application for good cycling. Uh, and the crop rotation. So we've always had that benefit of crop rotation. Early in the years, we probably only had about 20 to 25% of the cropland in a cereal crop, because again, wheat isn't highly profitable in Ohio. But it was very, we had livestock, we needed straw, uh, and a lot of times we would double crop soybeans or something else. We have over 3,000 insect species. Less than 10% uh, of those are harmful. So there's 300 harmful species out of 3,000 insect species that we have on the farm. So yes, we have slugs are a big issue in Ohio. They can, in the early ages of us doing cover cropping and no-till, they were crop limiting and we would have to uh, replant based on slug damage in some areas. Today, because of that beneficial population, we have so many predators of the slugs themselves uh, that they're not crop limiting from that standpoint. So yes, we still have some damage, we still have some crop feeding, but it really doesn't limit uh, the yield based on that alone. So uh, in 2000, when dad got that new uh, uh, 815 corn planter, it didn't have insecticide boxes, so we did not apply insecticide in row anymore. So that has been a big contributor to the growth in the beneficial insect population because we don't apply uh, granular insecticide and have not seen any uh, loss in crop yield from that. Uh, the transition to the non-traded crops, we're also going away from treated seed because we want to maintain the fungal population in the soil. Uh, because we use the, the cover crops at maturity, it's later in the season, the soil is warm, it's not as wet, so we don't have problems with Rhylactonia and some of the other fungal disease that might happen because of cold, wet soils. 
So we don't need that seed treatment in that sense, right? So we're, we're building up these populations of beneficials based on our management and agronomic practice. Uh, so we'll see. One benefit we have is all our neighbors use all the traits and all the treatments. So they kind of protect us if there was an issue. But we've never really had huge uh, issues in our region. We're kind of in a nice area from that standpoint. So that's the benefit we have there. Um, but it's possible. A lot of the guys, you know, you're, our agronomist that we work with, Dad's worked with for years, <laughs> which drives us crazy because he tells us every year this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, you know. And every year it works to some degree or other. <laughs> but he was in the other day, you know, he says, oh, I saw some cutworm and some armyworm. You got to go out there and apply some insecticide. We're like, okay, you saw two out of 300 acres, you know, two in, you know, we're not going to worry about it. So uh, it's, and he, I think from that standpoint, he's kind of antagonistic to what we're doing. So that keeps us on our toes. Uh, we challenge him. He challenges us. It's kind of somewhat of a good relationship, but uh, my dad's about tired of his negative attitudes. So that might be it for that agronomist. So we'll see. <laughs> All right. Then, and that's the, where we've built it up. So we do a lot of consulting uh, because of our experience from that standpoint. We're very cautious when we tell guys, yeah, we can do it. It works on David Brandt's farm. You need to figure it out on yours. Uh, how much nitrogen contribution do cover crops give? All these guys, they want to know that. You know, how much can I expect I'm going to spend $40 an acre on cover crops? Well, you should be able to see that kind of reduction in your input costs. It should be a wash based on that, whether it's a reduced fertilizer, reduced insecticide, or reduced herbicide. So if it's not working, there's, there's a problem in your system from that standpoint that there's not that balance of cost. And we hope that over the years, uh, we expect it to see in uh, three to five years that benefit that you're going to see, that we see in our operation, and that you have to be patient and willing to look for that. A lot of guys see an initial benefit the first year, and year two and three it's kind of tailing off, and they kind of give up and go back to their old practices. So it does take a bit of time and resiliency in your practice to keep up with it. All right, so we, you know, we say we're not genetically modified, but uh, you know, you can have some fun with cover crops too. So. <laughs>